Hello and welcome to our exam 3 microbiology review. It's exam 3 already. How crazy is that? This review won't be totally comprehensive. It won't have every single detail, but it's a good way to evaluate the areas that you need to revisit and so on. Now our exam 3 material covers infection and infectious diseases. So what can infect us and how do these infections occur? Epidemiology was a very short lecture and it is also only like four or five questions on the exam. But that's how do we study and quantify diseases in a population. Immunology, what do our immune systems do when these infections occur? And immunization and immune disorders, how can we prevent infection and disease? What happens to the immune system when it doesn't function correctly? And what is a vaccination? So we'll go over each of these topics over the next several slides. First off, infection and infectious diseases. So remember that we have normal microbiota and it's very diverse. These are the microbes that call us home. You can also call them the normal biota and the normal flora. So those are all interchangeable terms. And we have a mutualistic relationship with our normal microbiota. So we both benefit, the microbes and us benefit from this relationship. Microbes benefit because they have a place to live and they have nutrients to use. We benefit from this relationship because microbes protect us from disease. Our normal microbiota protects us from potential pathogens calling us home. So our normal microbiota takes up a bunch of space and nutrients, then that prevents pathogens from binding and proliferating and leading to an infection. And remember that microorganisms are not just bacteria. So lots of things uh, are part of our normal microbiota. That would include archaea, viruses, parasites like protozoans and helminths, and fungi too. These are all part of our normal microbiota. Now, what is a pathogen? A pathogen is a microorganism that causes a disease. So would all types of microorganisms be considered pathogens? Absolutely not. Types of bacteria are pathogens, but we have types of bacteria that aren't pathogens and don't cause disease too. Types of viruses are pathogens, types of fungi, and types of parasites, including those protozoans and helminths. You'll see that archaea did not make this list. That's because there are no known archaea that cause disease in humans, so they are not considered pathogens. Some examples of normal microbiota. So we have Streptococcus mutans in our mouth. That is the most common bacteria that's going to lead to dental caries or cavities. Staphylococcus epidermidis on our skin, that's the most common bacteria that calls our skin home. We all have that on our skin. And then many types of E. coli in our gut. That's going to be essential for breaking down food and giving us essential vitamins and nutrients. The parts of our body that have the most extensive and diverse microbiota will be our skin, which makes sense because it's in constant contact with the environment around us, things we're touching, and then also our gut. Do all parts of the body have normal flora? Absolutely not. We have parts of the body that are sterile and should not have any normal microbiota, like the blood, heart, and lungs. If microbes are present here, that means there is an infection happening. And then what happens when these normal microbiota go bad? So many of our normal microbiota are considered opportunistic pathogens. And these are microbes that would normally not cause any issues in someone that's healthy. But if someone has a weakened immune defense or they're immunocompromised, then that pathogen can take the opportunity to lead to an infection. So Staphylococcus epidermidis, for example, is an opportunistic pathogen. We all have it on our skin, but it can potentially over-proliferate, overgrow, lead, leading to an infection and potential disease in someone whose immune system and immune defenses can't keep Staphylococcus epidermidis at the normal growth level. How do we know that a given pathogen causes a disease? So how do we link a specific pathogen to a specific disease? This is something called Cox postulates, and this is uh, developed by the Robert Cox that we learned about for exam one. And he developed these lists of postulates or rules that all must be met in order to determine if a specific pathogen causes a specific disease. So Cox postulates are as follows. You have a diseased organism, and this pathogen that causes this disease must be present in every case of the disease. Then you isolate that pathogen from the diseased organism and you grow it in pure culture. So the pathogen must be isolated. That isolated pathogen is then re-inoculated into a healthy organism. 
and you must observe that same disease uh, in that organism that you inoculated. The pathogen then must be re-isolated from that infected healthy organism. And then you can specifically link this pathogen to causing a specific disease. Now we use a lot more of like genomic sequencing and PCR and genetics to determine a specific pathogen to a specific disease because Cox postulates has many limitations. So first off, it's in animal models and that's not a perfect analog to a human. Then isolating a pathogen is sometimes very difficult. So for example, if you're trying to isolate a virus in pure culture, you're going to have to have its host cell present because we remember viruses are uh, parasites. They require that host cell in order to replicate. And then sometimes the infected host just doesn't experience the classic signs and symptoms. So sometimes even though someone is infected, they have the pathogen present in their system, they're not presenting with the signs and symptoms of a disease. And we'll, uh, this will pop up again in a few slides. But an example of that is the carrier state. So someone can be a carrier of a pathogen. And recall that we talked about um, typhoid Mary as the example for a carrier. She carried salmonella typhi. Now, how do pathogens get from point A, the reservoir, to point B, the host? Well, the pathogen's reservoir is where it lives. And there are three types of reservoirs. A pathogen can live in humans, in animals, and in the environment. And you can see that this kind of covers just all of our bases. So almost anything can be a reservoir for a pathogen, depending on the type of pathogen. How is this pathogen going to uh, be transmissed from one place to another or, or move from host to host? Here are these different modes of transmission. There is droplet, or this can be through sneezing or coughing, direct contact, skin to skin, vehicle. So this is inanimate things like food and water, and then vectors like flies and mosquitoes. And then portals of entry and exit. Microorganisms can get into us many different ways depending on how it, depending on the transmission, and it can also leave different ways. The portal of entry and exit is not always the same for the pathogen. For example, there are uh, pathogens that follow the fecal oral route. So Salmonella typhi for um, typhoid fever is fecal oral route. So that means the pathogen is shed in the feces and then that pathogen is ingested through the mouth. So does someone have to be sick and display the signs and symptoms of a disease in order to transmit that disease? Absolutely not, like we just said. There are carriers, and this is someone that harbors a pathogen without showing signs and symptoms. And there are different types of carrier states depending on which stage of disease you're actually infectious and able to spread that pathogen. So there's an incubatory carrier, someone that can spread the pathogen during the uh, incubation stage before you have experienced signs and symptoms. Convalescent carriers, so after you've gotten better, or you think you've gotten better, you still have enough pathogens present to shed and transmit to someone else. And then chronic carriers that can carry a pathogen over months or years. Next up, we have communicable and non-communicable diseases. So a communicable disease is one that can be transmitted from human to human or host to a host. A non-communicable disease comes from a common source and it is not transmitted from host to host. So an example of a non-communicable or common source outbreak would be food poisoning. So if you went to a picnic and you all had the bad potato salad, the incidence or number of new cases of food poisoning would be really high for a short amount of time, but it would go away as people uh, got better from that sickness. Compared to a propagated or communicable disease, this is one that can be transmitted from host to host throughout a population. So an example would be common cold. And you'll see that incidence kind of fluctuates, but it never really totally leaves the population because it is constantly being spread to new hosts. Types of communicable diseases, and again, these are diseases that are transmitted from host to host. So it can be transmitted two different ways. There's horizontal transmission and there's vertical transmission. Vertical transmission is going to be from parent to offspring. This can be through the placenta, through milk, and then horizontal transmission is every other type of transmission. So direct contact or droplet, every other type. 
Here are some important definitions to know regarding infection and infectious disease. Know about nosocomial infections and those important factors that are involved in nosocomial infections. So why do hospital acquired, infection, hospital acquired infections happen? Well, they happen because those patients are most often going to be immunocompromised. It's going to happen because a hospital is such a um, populated place. There are a lot of people, doctors, nurses, patients, visitors, and then there are constantly um, drugs and antimicrobials being used in hospitals, so there's a higher chance of having resistant strains present in hospitals as well. Disease versus infection. So an infection is specifically talking about colonizing a host by a microbe. So it's specifically talking about microbes. All diseases are not caused by an infection. A disease is just any instance where your body is not functioning as it should so they're not that is not all caused by microbes and do all infections lead to a disease no we just talked about carrier states so you can be infected or have a pathogen present and you could not experience the signs and symptoms of a disease then you have signs these are objective findings so this would be like heart rate blood pressure things that someone can just observe by looking at you or collecting data compared to symptoms and this is something that a patient has to tell you. They have to tell you how they feel, if they feel nauseous, tired, if they feel in pain. Pathogenicity, this is just a yes or no. Can a microbe cause disease? So remember we talked about the different types of pathogens. They can be bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. And if a microbe can cause disease, then it, yes, is a pathogen. And then virulence, this, uh, this is the degree of pathogenicity or how virulent something is depending on how easily it can cause an infection. And we determine how virulent a pathogen is by looking at the LD50 or the ID50. And LD50 is the median lethal dose, ID50 is the median infectious dose. Lethal dose is talking about mortality, the infectious dose is talking about morbidity or just the observing who in the population has experienced that disease. This graph over here is showing percent mortality, so we're talking about the median lethal dose. This is the LD50. You calculate the LD50 by looking at what percent, or, or looking at 50% of the population, and then seeing at what number of pathogen, pathogenic agents or uh, cells or virions, whatever the infectious agent is, leads to mortality in 50% of that population. So you kind of cross over 50% and go down and then right here, so this would be 10 to the 4, are the number of pathogenic agents that lead to death in this certain experimental group. And pay attention here, though, that the lower number of pathogenic agents required to lead to mortality means that this pathogen is more virulent. So if you, only, if you need fewer and fewer cells or virions to lead to mortality, that means that that pathogen is more virulent. Now the steps of pathogenesis. So we have exposure, adhesion, invasion, and infection. Exposure makes sense for the first step of pathogenesis because you have to make contact with this pathogen to ever be infected with it. Then adhesion, that pathogen needs to attach to host tissues. And then it will evade your host defenses like your immune system. And then it will lead to infection. And the infectious stage is where this pathogen is actively replicating, actively releasing enzymes, potential toxins, and this is where you're most likely going to experience the classic signs and symptoms of that disease. What is a virulence factor? A virulence factor increases a pathogen's ability to cause infection and lead to a disease. So it's lots of things. Virulence factors are gonna be things that pathogens use to evade your immune system or attach to you more effectively. It could be the presence of a capsule to uh, prevent being phagocytized by your white blood cells. It could release toxins. It could mutate over time in order to not be flagged by the antibodies you have made to detect it. So many different things can be virulence factors. And then know the periods of disease and know kind of the relationship between periods of disease and the number of pathogenic particles. So during the incubation period, whenever you have first made contact with that pathogen, the number of pathogenic particles are really low and you are not experience, experiencing signs and symptoms yet. As that pathogen 
gets to the point where it starts replicating, the number of pathogenic particles is increasing, you enter the prodromal period where you experience kind of general signs and symptoms, and then that pathogen keeps replicating, and now the period of illness is where you would experience the classic signs and symptoms of that disease. Then your immune system is going to catch up. It's going to start clearing that infection and lead to this period of decline where the number of pathogenic organisms is decreasing because your immune system is taking care of it. During this period of decline, though, your immune system can be very overwhelmed, so this can also be the point in time when you experience a secondary infection. And then the peri period of convalescence, whenever you have successfully cleared that infection and you um, no longer have the disease. Epidemiology. So this is the branch of study that's interested in finding information about health outcomes and diseases in a population. And then some definitions that you should know for epidemiology would be morbidity versus mortality. Morbidity, morbidity is talking about the presence of the disease, so experiencing the signs and symptoms of a disease. And mortality is death as a result of that disease. Incidence versus prevalence. Incidence is the number of new cases. So if you remember the epidemiologist's bathtub, Incidence was the water going into the bathtub, number of new cases. Prevalence is the accumulation of that water in the bathtub, so the accumulation of cases over a certain period of time. And then uh, I'll get back to this in a second, the sporadic endemic and so on. But know the epidemiological triad. So in order for disease to occur, the environment, the agent, and the host must all be present which makes sense. We have to be in an, in an environment where that pathogen is present. And then a host has to make contact with that pathogen in order to become infected. So all of these things are required. And then the sporadic endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. So understanding disease transmission in these different populations. Oh, and know that epidemiology, we're talking about in a population. So it's in a defined population. We're not talking about just one individual. We're talking about looking at a defined population. And that could be global. That could be just in a small city. That could be in a very small population you're interested in looking at within one hospital. But either way, we're talking about populations. A sporadic disease is one that is not linked to a specific region and it happens very sporadically. So it could potentially happen anywhere at any time. An endemic disease is one that is specific to a certain location, so it has a normal range where it occurs, but it usually, this is usually happening at a very low incidence. Epidemic, this is going to be in a specific region and concentrated at a higher incidence than normal. And then pandemic, a disease is happening globally with a higher incidence than normal. On to immunology. And first we'll talk about the branches of the immune system and the different lines of, dis of defense. So our immune system has two branches. We have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And then we have three lines of defense. One, two, three lines of defense. Our first line of defense is part of our innate immune system and that is our physical barriers, like our skin and our mucosa. Our second line of defense happens after that first line of defense has been broken. And that is going to be our um, inflammatory response, fever, different types of chemicals that we have. That's all our second line of defense. And this is part of our innate immune system. Now over in the adaptive immune system, we have the third line of defense, and that is our specific immune response where we actually have immune memory. And the adaptive immune response has two different branches to it. There is cell-mediated and humoral. Cell-mediated is focusing on uh, cytotoxic T cells or T lymphocytes. And these are cells that mature in the thymus, T cells. And the humoral response focuses on B cells making antibodies. And B cells mature in the bone marrow. So cells of the immune system. We have different formed elements in the blood. We have erythrocytes or red blood cells, platelets, and many types of white blood cells or leukocytes with different jobs. But all of these formed elements come from the bone marrow. They come, they come from stem cells that are in your bone marrow, and then they differentiate into all these different types of formed elements in the blood. 
the different types of white blood cells or leukocytes. They are branched into granulocytes and agranulocytes just based off if they look granular under the microscope. And I won't really be asking you to differentiate between these two, but I do want you to know that all of these are white blood cells. All of these are white blood cells. We have basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cell, and they are a uh, phagocytic cell, so they consume bacteria and break it down. And then we have types of lymphocytes, and those are going to include T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. T cells and B cells are part of the adaptive immune response. And then monocytes mature into macrophages. Macrophages are another example of a phagocytic cell. So all of these are types of white blood cells that come from stem cells in your bone marrow. A little bit more about the first and second lines of defense. Just be familiar with the uh, what makes the first line of defense the first line of defense. So we have those tight junctions between the skin cells of our mucus membranes and our skin. And then we also have the secretion of some types of chemicals like lysozyme. Lysozyme is an important enzyme for the first line of defense. And also our normal, normal microbiota is important for our first line of defense. And then second line of defense occurs as a result of that first line of defense being breached. It was broken somehow. Pathogens were able to get past the first line of defense. And the second line of defense is really going to involve uh, the inflammatory response and different types of white blood cells. So during that inflammatory response, you have this damaged tissue that's going to release histamine, which is a type of cytokine, a way that cells communicate with each other. Histamine is going to start a whole cascade of things that elicit that immune response or that inflammatory response. It's going to cause capillaries to become leaky and dilate. So those capillaries are going to widen, allowing more blood to get to the area, which makes sense because we want a bunch of blood formed elements to get to the area, like platelets for clotting factors. It's going to call phagocytic cells to the area, like neutrophils to come phagocytize bacteria that have entered. And then be familiar with the cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And understand that these signs of inflammation are really a direct uh, cause of the release of this cytokine histamine. Redness and heat and swelling from, the, uh, from those capillaries widening and allowing more blood to get to the area. And then other examples of our second line of defense would be like natural killer cells, which are looking for cells that have um, mismatched MHC receptors, so major histocompatibility 1 receptors, are complement proteins, so-called because they complement the immune system function. And complement proteins can have um, a lot of different jobs, but the one that I'm interested in you knowing is the cascade of complement proteins to form the MAC, so the uh, membrane attack complex, and they can actually sit on the surface of a pathogen and cause a make a hole in that membrane and kill that pathogen. And then interferon is a type of cytokine that cells can release to alert other cells in the area that they have been infected with a virus. And those are all examples of the second line of defense. Now, a little bit about the third line of defense. So this is our adaptive or specific immune response. So this is gonna let your body recognize and defend itself against very specific invaders. And this is where immune memory comes into play and self-tolerance comes into play. So your immune system isn't attacking your own cells. There are two types of specific immunity, and then it is your humoral and cell-mediated immunity. Like I said, humoral is going to be B cells that make antibodies. Cell-mediated is talking about cytotoxic T cells. And right here in the middle, we have this very important cell right here, a helper T cell. Helper T cells are really important cells for activating both your humoral and cell-mediated immunity. It is helper T cells that are infected by HIV, and so it is a detrimental, it's detrimental to your immune system because now you can't activate humoral or cell-mediated immunity. What is an antigen? Anything your body sees as foreign and triggers an immune response. So that could be part, a part of a bacterial cell 
or part of a virus or potentially part of one of your own cells if your body sees your own cells as foreign. Our bodies make specific antibodies that bind specific antigens. So pay attention to that word specific. Very specific antibodies bind specific antigens. And that is what lets your body know that a specific pathogen is present. That's what gives your body the um, specificity of the adaptive immune response and that immune memory. How do our immune systems identify self from non-self? We have MHC1 or major histocompatibility 1 receptors or markers on all of our nucleated cells. And this lets your immune system know what's you and what's foreign. This is what natural killer cells are checking to make sure all of your cells belong in your body. Uh, was there something else here? There we go. And then antibodies. Antibodies are a really important part of that third line of defense. They're also called immunoglobulins or Ig. And we have five different types of antibodies. IgA is in secretions like saliva, mucus, and tears. IgD is an important part of a, a B cell and B cell receptors. IgE is important for allergic reactions and antiparasitic uh, activity. IgG is the most common antibody. This is also one that can cross the placenta. And IgM is a pentamer, so it's composed of one, two, three, four, five antibodies together. And it is important for agglutination. So it brings a bunch of pathogens together. It's able to bind one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pathogens at once and clump them all together. Antibodies can have different jobs. So they can be involved in opsonization. So they can act as markers to identify a pathogen for phagocytosis. And what is happening there is an antibody is literally coding a pathogen and alerting the immune system that a pathogen is present and allowing a phagocytic cell like a macrophage or a neutrophil to come along and consume it and break it down. Neutralization, some antibodies can work as antitoxins, so they can block where a toxin would normally bind. They can also neutralize viruses and block where a virus would normally bind. Complement fixation, so they can allow for complement binding and the activation and cascade of different uh, complements communication with the rest of the immune system, like the formation of the MAC, the membrane attack complex. And like I said, agglutination, this is going to be IgM, the antibody that's a pentamer. And this allows bacteria to be clumped together so it's less likely to spread and easy for your, easier for your immune system to identify and clear. Antibodies and the primary and secondary immune response. During the primary immune response, so this is going to be the first time that you have seen a pathogen, that your immune system has seen it, this is high levels of IgM, the antibody IgM. This is the primary antibody for your primary immune response. During secondary immune response, after you have seen this pathogen again, it is your secondary exposure, all subsequent exposures, you have highest of the IgG antibody. So IgM is very high during the primary immune response. IgG is highest during the secondary and all subsequent exposures. How does your body make antibodies? With the help of B cells. So B cells are going to differentiate into plasma cells and plasma cells are antibody factories. And this of course is all part of the humoral immune system because we're talking about B cells and the humoral immune system is a branch of our adaptive immune response. So this is the, an example of how this B cell is activated to turn into a plasma cell to make antibodies. So a B cell, can identify antigens on the surface of a pathogen. So this bacteria should not be in your body. It has antigens, your body recognizes it as foreign. Your B cells recognize it as foreign. It's going to internalize that antigen and then present it to a helper T cell. That helper T cell is then gonna be like, oh, you are absolutely right, that guy should not be here. Let me release lymphokines. So these are a type of cytokine or a way that cells communicate with each other. This helper T cell is gonna release these cytokines and tell the B cell, yeah, you better go ahead and differentiate into a plasma cell. 
that B cell will then differentiate into a plasma cell. That plasma cell will make a bunch of specific antibodies for that antigen. So now these antibodies can go around and bind these antigens and then flag them for the immune system. Some B cells are also, also differentiate into memory B cells. A B cell I just have over here is just a reminder that a B cell does not have to be activated directly from the pathogen, from antigens on the pathogen. It can also be activated by an antigen presenting cell. So we have other white blood cells that can pick up these antigens and put them on their surface and go around and show them to B cells to show B cells, hey, this is, the, this is who we're looking for. So it does not have to be directly from the pathogen. Now, was that the end of immunology? Okay, on to immunization and immune disorders. So if you remember the first part of that lecture, we talked about vaccines, and we specifically talked about Edward Jenner's cowpox vaccine. And just recall, why did Edward Jenner's cowpox vaccine work for smallpox? Those are two different things, cowpox and smallpox. Cowpox and smallpox are both variola viruses. And so whenever Edward Jenner realized that people who experienced cowpox did not get smallpox, that same vaccine that was developed for cowpox was also effective for smallpox. So the antigens on the surface of these two viruses are extremely similar, so similar that your body recognizes them as the same virus. So being vaccinated against cowpox works against smallpox. And would vaccinations be innate or adaptive immunity? That would be part of your adaptive immune response. So you are making antibodies, you're developing immune memory. How do vaccines work? You're given a small amount of some harmless form of a disease that alerts your immune system to then make antibodies against that disease. And that gives you immune memory. So whenever you encounter that disease again in the future, your body has the antibodies and the memory cells to elicit a more productive, immediate immune response in the future. So you are immune to that disease. Here are the different types of or classes of vaccines. Live attenuated vaccines expose you to a weakened version of a li the live form of the whole pathogen. So for live attenuated, it's live, but it's attenuated or weakened, and it's the whole pathogen. This produces an active subclinical infection because this pathogen is alive. So it's able to, it's still able to replicate. So that is an active subclinical, subclinical infection. It's subclinical though, because it's not um, presenting with the same signs and symptoms as, as what you would experience if this pathogen weren't weakened. And it's activating both cellular and humoral immunity. So it activates a very robust immune response that gives you very long, a very long immune memory against that pathogen. Because it does cause an active subclinical infection, though, it's really not safe for immunocompromised patients who are not able to mount an effective immune response to clear that very small but active subclinical infection. Inactivated vaccines, so these are pathogens that have been killed or inactivated, but you are still exposed to the whole pathogen. And this does not produce an active infection because these pathogens are not alive, so they're not replicating. Subunit vaccines are only going to expose you to key antigens of that pathogen, so not the whole pathogen. Toxoid vaccines only expose you to an inactivated bacterial toxin, so it's not exposing you to the whole pathogen. It's not even exposing you to the pathogen. It's exposing you to a toxin that that, that, that pathogen makes. And then conjugate vaccines, this is a type of subunit vaccine that allows your immune system to more easily target pathogens with capsules. Because remember, a capsule is a type of glycocalyx that makes it really difficult for your phagocytic cells to consume and break down those pathogens. So this, these subunit vaccines let your immune system target those pathogens more easily. And definitely know a bit about herd immunity. Herd immunity is when a high percentage of our population is vaccinated, and this makes it more difficult for infectious diseases to spread. But also know that all um, infectious diseases or all infectious diseases are not just stopped by herd immunity. The example I believe I gave in lecture was tetanus. So if you get a tetanus shot, 
that is not a communicable disease. It's not, it does not go from person to person. You get it from the environment. So even if everyone else is vaccinated against tetanus, if I'm not vaccinated, I have just as much of a chance of um, being infected with that pathogen. What is serology testing? So serology testing is looking for the presence or level of antibodies in the blood. So we're not, there is also molecular testing, which is looking at genetics, but serology testing is looking to see if you have developed antibodies, if you have activated a um, humoral immune response toward a pathogen and developed antibodies. Now the immune system can cause diseases too. And we talked about a few examples. We talked about hypersensitivities, immunodeficiencies, and autoimmune diseases. And then there were different types of hypersensitivities, and we'll kind of go through very quickly what these, um, the different types of immune disorders were. So hypersensitivities, this is an exaggerated immune response. So an antigen gets into your body, and your body kind of freaks out more than it maybe should. There are four types of hypersensitivities. The type 1 hypersensitivity is going to involve the immunoglobulin or antibody IgE. And this is when, uh, this, an example of this is food allergies for type 1 hypersensitivities. Type 2 hypersensitivities are going to involve IgG and IgM. And these are cytotoxic hypersensitivities. And this is whenever your body recognizes um, non-self cells. So an example would be blood typing. If you receive the wrong blood during a blood transfusion, though your body may have antibodies against that blood type. So it's cytotoxic. Those antibodies are going to target those blood cells to tell your immune system to um, kill and lyse those red blood cells. Type 3 hypersensitivities are going to be IgG, IgM, and some IgA. And this is in immune complexes. So this is whenever these antibodies kind of cause aggregates or cause these um, antibody and antigen complexes to bind together and accumulate. And this, of course, leads to an exaggerated immune response because you have an accumulation of a bunch of these antibody antigen complexes that are recruiting a lot of immune system activity in one area of your body, or it can be more systemic. It can kind of happen system wide as well. And then type four hypersensitivities is involving, uh, this is T cell mediated. So now we're not talking about antibodies anymore. We're talking about T cells. And this is involving cytotoxic T cells. Uh, let's see. And then we have immunodeficiencies. Immunodeficiency, uh, deficiencies are any disorder that's caused by your immune system being absent or just being reduced in its response. And there are two types of immunodeficiencies that can be inherited or primary, and they can be acquired or secondary. Inherited immunodeficiencies are going to be most common in developed countries where you have access to health care. And these, because these defects are inherited, and then acquired immunodeficiency is going to be most common globally for regions that don't have access to health care or food or clean water because the most common cause of immunodeficiency globally is malnutrition. But acquired immunodeficiencies can also be caused by many other things as well, so that, like prolonged illness, HIV, immunosuppressive treatments, um, cytotoxic treatments, and chemotherapy, and so on. And finally, autoimmune diseases. This is the loss of immune tolerance in your body or your immune system is no longer able to identify your own cells from enemy cells. And just know the examples here of celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and psoriasis, and kind of what cells are targeted for each of these um, autoimmune diseases. So that is the exam three review. Like I said, not totally comprehensive, but um, hopefully, you know, just, just listen to this lecture on like two times speed, just like jog your memory on some things and continue studying. Reach out to me with any questions or concerns.